Greetings, Vilhuvians. Ruby and Queen here. Hope you have a good week so far. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving last week. Well, we look at the 10th Doctor era continues on with the Shakespeare Code. So, here we go. The 10th Doctor, who promised to take Martha on one trip, takes her to performance of Love's, of Love's Labor's Lost at the Globe Theater in Southwark in, 15, in 1599. At the end of the play, William Shakespeare announces the forthcoming sequel entitled Love's Labors 1. A witch called Lilith uses a voodoo doll to influence Shakespeare to declare that the new play will premiere the following evening. When Lindley, the master of the revels, demands to see the script before, before allowing the play to proceed, Lilith plunges a voodoo doll made of his hair into a bucket of water and stabs it in the chest. Lindley collapses on the ground, dead. Lilith compares Shakespeare to write a strange concluding paragraph to Love's Labors One before flying away on a broom. In the morning, in the morning, the Doctor, Martha, and Shakespeare proceed to the Globe Theater, and the Doctor asks why the theater has fourteen sides. The detective is the, ar the architect of the theater in Bethlehem Hospital. They find the architect, Peter Street, in a catatonic state. The Doctor helps him emerge from his catatonia long enough to reveal that the witches dictated the Globe's tetra. Deca decagonal design to him. The witches Lilith, Doomfinger, and Bloodtide observe this through their cauldron, and Doomfinger teleports to the cell and kills Peter with a touch. The Doctor identifies the witches as Carrionites, a species whose magic is based on the power of words which allows them to manipulate psychic energy. By the name Carriot, the Doctor is able to repel her. The Doctor deduces that the Carrionites intend to use the powerful words of Love's Labors One to break their species out of imprisonment. The Doctor confronts Lilith, who explains that three witches were released from their banishment by Shakespeare's genius words after he lost his son, Hamnet. Lilith temporarily stops one of the Doctor's two parts and flies to the Globe Theater. Shakespeare fails to stop the play from being performed. The actors speak the last lines of the play. A portal opens up, allowing the Carrionites back into the universe. The doctor tells Shakespeare that he could only find the words to close that only he could find the words to close the portal. Shakespeare improvises a short rhyming stanza, but is stuck for a final word until Martha blurts out expel Yarmus. The Carrionites and all and all the copies of Love's Labors One are stuck back together through the closing portal. Oh, well, that was interesting. So let's look a little so let's take a look at a little bit of continuity here, beginning with Shakespeare and Doctor Who. Shakespeare has appeared in one earlier Doctor Who episode, and the Doctor has also mentioned prior meetings. The Bard is seen by the Doctor and his companions on the on the screen of their time space visualizer in the chase, conversing with the, with Elizabeth I. In Planet of Evil, the fourth Doctor mentions having met Shakespeare, and the City of Death he claims that he helped transcribe the original ha manuscript of Hamlet, and in the Mark of the Rani, the sixth Doctor says, I must see him again sometime. Among non-TV material, Shakespeare features in the Virgin Missing, Aven Virgin Missing Adventures novels, The Empire of Glass, The Empire of Glass and The Plotters, and in the Big Finish Productions audio drama, The Kingmaker. In another Big Finish drama, The Time of the Daleks, a child is revealed to be Shakespeare at the story's end. This is a sequel in Ian e. Potter's short story, Apocryphia by Petium and Short Trip's Companions, which concerns the young Shakespeare's act an acronistic meeting with some of the characters he will he will later portray in Trillius and Credessa. Finally, the bard also appears in the Doctor Who magazine Nine Doctor comic A Gross Word of Wit, also written by Gareth Roberts. Producer Russell T. Davies and screenwriter Gareth Roberts have both stated that they were aware of these past references to meeting Shakespeare, but that they would be neither mentioned nor contradicted in the episode. Roberts added that although early draft of the Shakespeare Code contained a slight reference to City of Death, it was removed because, quote, it was so sly it would have been a bit confusing for fans that recognized it and baffled the bejesus out of everyone else. Hmm. Now let's take a look at references to earlier Doctor Who episodes and stories. The name of the Carrionites derives from screenwriter Gareth Roberts' own new adventures novel, Zamper, which refers to a slug-like race known as the Arianites. Roberts has said, quote, I always thought it was a nice word, and I was thinking of the witches carrying creatures, so I bunched a C in front of it. Hmm. In the Lost Adventure novel by Douglas Adams, Shada, there is a passing reference to a Time Lord, Scintilla, 
who was in prison for conspiring with Carrionites. There are several references to races from earlier Doctor Who episodes. At one point, the Doctor used his title Sir Doctor of Tardis, which had been awarded to him by Queen Victoria in Tooth and Claw. The Carrionites' contribution to Love's Labors One includes a reference to Dravidian Shores. A Dravidian starship is mentioned in the brain of Morbius. Lilith refers to the Eternals, a race introduced in the original series serial Enlightenment. In addition, the Doctor finds a skull in Shakespeare's prop store that reminds him of the Sycorax race from the Christmas invasion. When the Doctor mentions the name Sycorax to Shakespeare, Shakespeare says he used the name. The joke that is the joke is that the name in fact derives from Caliban's mother in Shakespeare's play The Tempest. Other sequences include subtle references to much earlier episodes. One of the putative lines of Love's Labors 1, Thy Should Have Contentment Where It Rests, is taken from episode 3 of the 1965 serial The Crusade, a story consciously written in Shakespeare title, in Shakespeare style. Now let's take a look at reference to other <clears throat> works, including ref beginning with references related to Shakespeare. The episode concerns the lost Shakespeare play Love's Labors 1, which is referred to in more than one historical document, or which may just be in an an alternative title for an extended play. Historically, a reference to Love's Labors 1 in Francis Murray's Pelitis Tamia, which treasury, predates the construction of the Globe Theatre. The Doctor and Martha make numerous references to Shakespeare's appearance. She knows that he looks nothing like his portrait and wonders why he is not bald. The Doctor says he could make his head bald if he rubs it and later gives him a ruff to keep, calling it a neck brace. Shakespeare himself speaks with a noticeable Midlands accent and remembers to his birth and upbringing in Stratford upon Avon. The episode makes reference to the many debates about Shakespeare's sexuality. <clears throat> Shakespeare flirts with Martha multiple times during the episode and ultimately composes Sonnet 18 for her, calling her his dark lady. This is a reference to the enigmatic female character in Shakespeare's sonnets, although Sonnet 18 is in fact one of those addressed to a male character, the fair youth. Shakespeare specifically flirts with the Doctor as well, at which the Doctor observes 57, 57 academics just punch the air, a reference to the debates on this subject. There is a running joke throughout the episode in which the Doctor creates an apparent ontological paradox by inspiring Shakespeare to borrow phrases that the Doctor quotes from his plays. Examples of this include the Doctor telling Shakespeare that all the world's a stage from As You Like It and The Place The Thing from Hamlet as well as the name Sycorax from The Tempest. However, when Shakespeare himself coins the phrase to be or not to be, the doctor suggests he write it down, but Shakespeare considers it too pretentious. In a different version of the joke, the doctor exclaims once more unto the breach, and Shakespeare initially likes the phrase, for realizing it is one of his own from Henry V, which was probably written early 1599. When questioning Shakespeare about witches, Martha remarks that he has written about witches, a reference to Macbeth that Shakespeare denies. At the time in which the episode is set, Shakespeare had yet to write Macbeth or Hamlet, which probably features the paranormal, such as witches and ghosts. There are numerous other allusions to Shakespeare's plays. Just before the Doctor steps out the TARDIS, he exclaims, Brave New World, from Act 5, Scene 1 of The Tempest. In an early scene, a side is glimpsed for an inn named The Elephant. This is the name of an inn recommended in Twelfth Night. The three Carrionites allude to the Weird Sisters from Macbeth, which is written several years after the setting of this episode. Like them, the Carrionites use trochaic tetrameter and rhyming couplets to cast spells. When regressing the architect in Bedlam, the Doctor uses the phrase a winter's tale, whilst the architect himself uses the phrase poor Tom in the same way as the mad Edgar in King Lear. Lilith credits the Carrionites' escape from the Eternals' banishment to new, glittering worlds. Shakespeare is credited with adding two to three thousand words to the English language, including assassination, eyeball, leapfrog, and gloomy. The character Kemp is William Kemp, a highly regarded comic actor of the era, who was a member of the Lord Chamberlain's men along with Shakespeare and Richard Burbage. Wiggins is named after Dar Dr. Martin Wiggins, a distinguished academic in the field of Elizabethan and Jacobian literature, 
and the editor of several editions of influential plays of this period. Wiggins is also a Doctor Who fan and a friend of writer Gareth Roberts. According to Roberts, quote, if anyone was going to trip me after the transmission, it'd be him, so I thought I'd butter him up first. And then finally, let's look at other references. There are several references to the Harry Potter franchise. In one play, Martha says, It's all about Harry Potter, which prompts the Doctor to claim that he has read the final book in the series, which will not be released until three months after the episode was aired. The Doctor refers to it as Book 7 because the title had not been made public at the time of filming. At the end of the episode, Shakespeare, the Doctor, and Martha use a word from Harry Potter, Expelliarmus, to defeat the Carry Knights, and the Doctor exclaims, Good old J.K. These references include some meta-theatrical humor, since David Tennant played the villain Barty Crouch Jr. in the film adaptation of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. There are several references to the paradoxes of time travel. Martha mentions the possibility of killing her grandfather, an allusion to the grandfather paradox, when she first steps from the TARDIS. She also suggests that stepping on a butterfly might change the future of the human race, an idea that originates in Ray Bradbury's 1952 short story, A Sound of Thunder. The Doctor explains how history could be changed with devastating results by referring to the movie Back to the Future. Martha scorns this explanation by saying, the film, to which the Doctor returns, no, the novelization, yes, the film. There is indeed a novelization of Back to the Future written by George Gibb. Some of the words and names are used are derived from other words. The Doctor claims Martha comes from Fredonia, a fictional country in the Marx Brothers film Duck Soup. It was also used as the name of a planet in the Doctor Who novel Warmonger by Terence Dix. The planet Rixel 4 is named in an episode of The Tomorrow People from 1974. The Doctor quotes the line, Rage, Rage Against the Dying of the Light from do not go gentle in that good night by, Del by Dylan Thomas. But Warren Shakespeare cannot use it as it is somebody else's. Hmm. <clears throat> and now on to the production. So we'll look at that by looking at the writing and pre-production. This is this. Yeah, the episode was Gareth Roberts' first writing credit proper on the show. However, he had written for Doctor Who many times before. He started with some virgin new adventures a series of Doctor Who novels of the highest science. He went on to write several more books for Virgin Books and further Doctor Who spin-offs. For the new TV series, Roberts again produced a tie-in novel, Only Human, and then various smaller jobs for the TV show, including the Attack of the Grass digital television, interactive mini-episode, and the Tardisodes. As revealed in Doctor Who Adventures, issue 30, this episode had the working title Love's Labors 1, by the time of production, however, the title had been <clears throat> changed to Theater of Doom, according to David Tennant's video diary shot during production and included as a bonus feature of, of the Series 3 DVD set. Tennant remarks that the title would likely be changed before a broadcast, suggesting Theater of Doom was only a temporary title. The ending featuring Queen Elizabeth was Russell T. Davies' idea, told Roberts to, quote, make it like a bit of the ending of The One Doctor, a big finished production's audio drama, also written by Roberts. The scene in which the Martha, the scene in which the Doctor and Martha share a room was originally going to have was originally written to have the Doctor casually dressed down to his underwear, and still obviously invite Martha to share the bed. It was rewritten as the as the producers and tenant thought it would be inappropriate. Good idea. <clears throat> now let's take a look at it filming. Filming for the episode took place from August 23rd to September 15th, 2006. Production started at the production team's Upper Boat Studios in Forest for the scenes in the Crooked House. Production then went on a week of location night shoots, beginning Coventry, including Ford's Hospital for one night, before moving to the Lord Lakehister Hospital of Warwick. Scenes set in the Globe Theatre were then partially filmed in the recreated Globe Theatre in London. Apart from the Newport Indoor Market, where the scenes of Bedlam, as the Bethlehem Royal Hospital was, no was known as then, were recreated in the basement, the remainder of the shot took place in Upper Boat Studios, with scenes set in the Elephant Inn, sections of the Globe, of Globe Theatre material, and the TARDIS scenes. In SFX Magazine number 152, producer Phil Collison called this episode the most expensive ever, because of the large amounts of CGI and filming in Warwick, Coventry, and London. 
And now finally, on to the special effects. The special effects on this episode were done by The Mill, who have created the special effects on all Doctor Who episodes since its return in 2005. The vast amount of CGI work required was mainly for the climax of the episode. One shot of the Doctor and Martha looking at the Globe Theater was changed between the Series 3 preview at the end of The Runaway Bride and the final episode. The edge of the Globe Theater has been replaced with a CGI shot of a village and the distant theater itself. So overall, this is a pretty enjoyable episode, and and the whole thing with Shakespeare was kind of interesting, so yeah. So overall, I give The Shakespeare Code three sonic screwdrivers out of five. Well, tune in next week as we take a look at Gridlock. Well, hope you enjoyed this review, and if you did, be sure to like it, give it a thumbs up, share it around, subscribe if you, have, if you haven't already, click the bell icon to be notified about when I upload videos. Also, if you get a chance, be sure to check out my Patreon page, link is in the description. So, until then, this is Hoobie and Queen saying, Oh my giddy aunt! When I say run, run! I'm for the polarity of the neutron flow. Would you like a jelly baby? Fantastic! Allons y Geronimo! Bow ties are cool, fences are cool, and Stetsons are cool.